Today, uh, we're um, going to hear from Dr. Vanessa Wilkie, who's going to tell us about buying and building one of the world's greatest libraries, which is the Huntington Library in San Marino, California. I can, I've, I've got to admit, uh, before I uh, was a, uh, 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 really a much of a book collector, uh, visiting the Morgan, uh, visiting the Huntington, loving the gardens, and uh, I remember the Blue Boy, uh, but this is like 1970 or 71, and um, I, I think I, I, I failed to appreciate uh, the library itself, and I look forward to actually hearing about it from, uh, from Vanessa. I did read about it in the book she's going to talk about. Uh, she'll probably mention the, the Henry Huntington's um, Library of Libraries, uh, but. Uh, I look forward to hearing uh, certainly her uh, discussion. Uh, let's see. I want to, a lot of our people that have signed up are not members of the book club, but are members of other uh, bibliophilic organizations, uh, uh, probably members of uh, FABS or the Federation of American Bibliophilic Societies. Uh, Jennifer Larson has done a great job there uh, at. Uh, sharing uh, events uh, uh, among the clubs. And I'm sure that's probably how a number of you um, heard about today's event. So um, I'm gonna now move on uh, to, um, uh, to Vanessa. And she is the head of, of the uh, library tutorial uh, department and where she curates the library's renowned collections of medieval manuscripts and British history. She earned her PhD in British history at the University of California at Riverside and was a visiting assistant professor of history at University of Redlands before coming to the Huntington uh, in 2013. She's recently published a book called A Woman of Influence, The Spectacular Rise of Alice Spencer in Tudor, England. So um, with that brief introduction, let me turn it over to Vanessa. I would tell people that that we're um, that this is being recorded. Um, we hope to have it up on our website later. Um, we'd sit, we have, of course, quite a few people. Uh, I will have, you know, everybody I can see has their, is muted. I haven't heard any dogs barking or, uh, uh, and so I assume that's we're all in good shape. Uh, but um, let's uh, stay that way and then put questions into chat. Hopefully we'll have time at the end uh, to um, to take a look at those questions and and maybe open it up uh, uh, for people to raise their hand if I can if I can see them. So um, with that, uh, Vanessa, uh, take it away. So much for the invitation, for um, the the tech support <laughs> today. Um, you guys are all very very patient. Um, I've just dropped a, a link in the chat just to to put it there for your viewing pleasure. Um, that gives you an overview of all of the different collecting areas of the library, um, or many of the collecting areas that we'll we'll talk about. Um, when I received the invitation to come talk to this group, I figured I was talking to some real diehard bibliomaniacs. Um, and so I thought this would just be a nice opportunity on a Sunday afternoon to talk about, um, give an overview of the Huntington's library for, for those of you who haven't been here before, but also you know, kind of dive into one specific uh, collection, which is actually in a way several collections um, and talk a little bit about the history of this collection, how it came to be here, but also talk about um, how it's used today. And you know these things that our founder Henry Huntington acquired um, decades ago, or almost you know in this case over a century ago, are still um, vital to the work that happens every day at the Huntington. Um, I should say not today though because we're closed due to this, uh, this hurricane. <laughs> um, so to introduce to you, this is an, an aerial shot of the Huntington Library, Art Museum, and Botanical Gardens. And each one of these were, were an institution made up of three um, separate collecting areas. And each one is world-class in its own right and could be a standalone institution. 
And we're actually even stronger by the fact that we we think together. The, the term we use now at the Huntington is we are one Huntington with three very different institutions under this umbrella. The Huntington is about 12 miles northeast of downtown Los Angeles. And it's surrounded by, it's in the, the town of San Marino, surrounded by the city of Pasadena, um, most famous for the Rose Parade, which actually we'll talk about in just a minute. The library is this building. This is where I, I work, um, where I had planned on speaking to you from today, except we're closed today um, and tomorrow for because of the hurricane. Um, so the, the land at the Huntington uh, is just to give you broader historical context. I mean, you can look at this picture and you see this like, massive, beautiful building complex and all of these cultivated grounds and cultivated gardens. But the land itself is on um, the ancestral lands of the Gabrielonga, Tongva, and Keech nations people. And the institution does continue to have close relationships with members of these tribes because we all share this space and share this history. And it's um, a really important part of the kinds of conversations and the lenses that we bring to the collections that we have at the Huntington. So these three separate collecting divisions, the Art Museum has about 13,000 items spanning the 15th to the 20th century. Gary, as you rightfully pointed out, Blue Boy is probably the most iconic work in the Art Museum. Um, although in recent years, Blue Boy has a new friend by the artist Kahinde Wiley, who painted um, a portrait of a young gentleman as a conversation with Blue Boy. Um, Wiley, as you probably know, was the artist selected to paint President Obama's presidential portrait. And so to see Blue Boy at one end of the gallery with Wiley's painting at the other, um, it really is it's a sight to behold. They are in a really kind of up the ante in that, in that 18th century portrait. The botanical gardens are what we're probably most famous for for people outside the bibliographic community, we have over a million visitors a year who come to see 16 gardens across 210 acres. Um, they're, they're, it's traveling to a different world as you move across these, these gardens. Um, but of course, my heart and I think all of your hearts lie within the library. We have 11 million items spanning the 11th through the 21st century. We continue to grow and acquire um, material every single day. So it's it's a place that is very much shaped by our founders' visions, but also we, we build to strength and we bring new perspectives to those collections as we put them in conversation with each other. To give you an overview of the library, um, we have what we call 14 core collecting areas. Um, and I see in the participants list that my colleague Stephen Tabor, who is the curator of early printed books, has joined us. Um, and we are also joined by David Zeidberg, who was formerly the director of the library. So um, each of them, everyone can see the institution through a different lens. David, of course, sees the whole big picture um, as the, the director. Um, we, in these 14 core collecting areas, we have 12 curators and two assistant curators. We also have a support staff in the curatorial department because it, you know, it takes a lot of people to keep this place up and running. And then within the library, the curatorial department is just one of five separate departments within the library. So we also have, we work really closely with colleagues in our reader services department who um, are the pages and the people that run the reading rooms to make access to these collections possible for visitors. Um, we call our visitors readers. Um, if you, you come and use the library, you're a reader. Um, we have a preservation department, a digital collections and imaging services department, and of course, uh, our cataloging department that we call ACME, Acquisitions, Cataloging, and Metadata. Um, so the rare book catalogers, the archival processing team, um, and the people responsible for putting descriptions for the general collections, which you see a picture here of some of our general collections. Um, they all work in our ACME department. So all in all, the library has a staff of about 80 people, um, which again, is a pretty large library. Um, and yet we live, at, you know, the Huntington is this institution of close to 500 uh, employees. So we're We've grown significantly in the last couple of decades and we're continuing to grow um, it, quite rapidly, actually. 
So this is an overview of the people that come to use our collections. These are our statistics from last year. This is a photograph of um, the Amundsen Reading Room, which is our special collections reading room. Um, our numbers are not quite where they were before the pandemic, but they're really, really close. We have 13, 1,360 active readers. So every year your reader's card will last uh, one, three, you know, 365 days. So um, at last count, this is the number of active readers that we have. Um, those readers make over 7,000 visits to our reading room every single year. And while they're there, they consult over 20,000 um, rare materials. So either a single printed book or a box from a larger manuscript collection. Um, or we also, you know, blueprints, maps, all of the uh, photographs, scrapbooks, prints and ephemera, all of these different facets make their way into the documentation room that you see on your screen. When they're there, uh, year after year, uh, these are the top three most popularly consulted collections. Octavia E. Butler, the Afrofuturist sci-fi writer who is from Pasadena, but actually, um, I believe she lived in Seattle towards the end of her, her life. So she's local to you as well, although she's, you know, we're fortunate she's internationally celebrated as a phenomenally important and influential um, novelist. Uh, she left her papers to the Huntington and the collection opened a few years ago and from the minute that archive opened, it just flew to the top of the charts and has stayed firm as the most consulted collection at the Huntington, uh, with over 800 views last year. And then something that probably surprises most people at the institution, but the number two, number three, and number four spots are usually three British collections, these gigantic British archives that Henry Huntington acquired um, in his own lifetime. And then usually the number five is the Los Angeles County Court records. Um, so you kind of get a sense that what, what might seem like a little bit of like a research schizophrenia, it all actually makes sense when you're at the Huntington um, because we are devoted to making our collections available to people who are interested in the arts and the humanities and come from all across the globe to use these collections. We're one of the largest uh, privately funded research libraries in, in North America. We give about $2 million a year in research fellowships every year in the, the arts and humanities, which is a, a pretty hefty number of humanities. So the question of where does this all come from comes from this guy, Henry Huntington, who is our, our founder. And this, I believe, might be the picture on top of the cover of Donald Dickinson's book, Gary, that you mentioned, um, Library of Libraries. And it's a really phenomenal early history of how Henry Huntington started collecting the library in particular. Um, it's, it's something I referenced to prepare this talk, but it's actually something we all, the curatorial staff, references pretty regularly because there's just so much material there that as we're building to those strengths, we often wanna look back to reflect on what the impetus was to bring the collections here so that we can be strategic as we continue to grow those collections. Um, his mantra was this, um, I won't read it all to you, but you can see that he has this marked preference for British and American authors and artists I'm um, really collecting in the history and culture of the English speaking world. He loved books, printed books, manuscript collections, pictures and illustrations. Um, but one of the things that's missing from this document that was you know, produced in his own lifetime as sort of the North Star for his collecting principles is the fact that he also was acquiring extremely important um, tracks books, manuscripts in Spanish as well. He was really building an enormous collection of the Spanish empire in the Americas and in uh, Mexican history, particularly Alta California. Um, and so uh, even though we're really known for British and American arts and literature, uh, there's actually a much broader intersectional history of the peoples who lived in North America uh, and then, of course, the colonial endeavors of the uh, British Empire and the Spanish Empire. 
Um, and those scholars, those 1700 scholars that visit every year are often there doing histories of empire and doing histories of ideologies that fueled empire, of resistance to empire. Um, our, our collection supports studies in all of these fields. So how did it get here? <laughs> um, Henry Huntington, like his, you know, frenemies, I guess you would say, J.P. Morgan, um, Henry and Emily Folger, um, they really were American industrial capitalists who were take, taking advantage, sounds a little jaded, but they were um, using an opportunity that arose at the end of the 19th and beginning of the 20th century when um, aristocratic families in Western Europe and England in particular were uh, being hit with pretty heavy taxes to pay for the upkeep of their estates or to um, you know, fuel empire and fuel World War I a lot of these aristocratic families were faced with the choice of, do you sell your house, do you sell your land, or do you sell your art collections and your libraries and keep everything together? Um, and a lot of those families opted to sell their libraries. And people like Henry Huntington uh, was using that as the opportunity to kind of validate his new money by buying these old world treasures. Um, and of course, the, what he saw as, as the value in the collections is different than what we see today and different than how our readers use them today. But he really did buy entire libraries, entire archives on block, and then have them shipped to America. And we're going to talk about one of those collections in just a little bit. Um, this is the collection. This is the... Uh, the collection at the core of the talk I want to give to you today. Um, and I'll admit I'm a little selfish because um, the Ellesmere Manuscript Collection is my favorite collection. It's the reason that I started coming to the Huntington when I was a graduate student. Um, at the time, I had absolutely no idea I would become the curator for this material. But because it's it was my first introduction to the Huntington, it's a place, it's a collection that occupies a very special place in my heart. Even though I know, you know, I'm supposed to say I love all of my collections equally, like a good mother to the manuscripts, I, I have a soft spot in my heart for Ellesmere. Um, this collection is actually treated as two, and in, in actuality, three separate collections. The institution, uh, Henry Huntington in 1917 bought this entire library, meaning that he bought the printed books as well as the family archive. Um, he also bought a third collection in the umbrella of the Bridgewater Library called the LARPing Plays, uh, which I'm not going to talk very much about, but just to be authentic with the story of this acquisition, I wanted to mention it. Um, John Larpin was the examiner of plays. Um, between 1737 and 1824. And so anytime a play was performed in London, the group was supposed to submit the script to LARPin for review because it was a, a period of, of heavy censorship. Um, so these are the scripts that were approved. These are 2,500 copies. They all look the same for the most part, bound in these, these blue notebooks. They're all manuscripts for the most part. Um, and so it's the original scripts for... You know, all of the all of the plays performed in London. Um, just as a little aside, the the sample that I'm showing you here is a Vortigern. Um, for for all of you bibliomaniacs, Vortigern might sound familiar. This is a Shakespeare forgery created by William Henry Ireland in the 18th century. He claimed to have found uh, found in a trunk a an original manuscript of Shakespeare's play Vortigern not a real play. He made the whole thing up. It was performed once in London on Jury Lane. Um, as the performance was going on, the audience became more and more outraged uh, because clearly it was not Shakespeare. Um, and then the whole thing kind of collapsed and he ended up uh, dying in disgrace years later. Um, but I, you know, this is just one of thousands and thousands and thousands of manuscripts that came when Henry Huntington purchased the Bridgewater Library, and it lives alongside 2,500 other scripts from the period. So the Bridgewater Library 
the institution, like most institutions at the beginning of the 20th century, you know, separated out printed materials from manuscript materials. And we kind of live with that legacy today, although um, we're much more inclined now to blur those lines. Um, and as I said, my colleague, Steve Tabor is, is on the Zoom right now. And Steve and I, Steve is a curator of early printed books. He's the curator on record for the Bridgewater Library, the printer track. And the curator of manuscripts, the curator on record for the year question. Um, and so we often joke that there's a trench worn between our two offices as we're walking back and forth trying to make sense out of this collection. So in 1917, when the Earls of Ellesmere, that's what the title, um, the, they were barons of Ellesmere um, in the 17th century, and then um, they became the Earls of Bridgewater was their next promotion. Um, that's where you get the Ellesmere and Bridgewater titles. Their surname is Edgerton. So it's the Edgerton family, um, the Bridgewater Library, the Ellesmere Manuscripts, it's all the same. When you work with British history, you get really used to all of these different titles and names becoming a bit of a quagmire. But in 1917, the Earls of Ellesmere, who were the owners of this collection, um, decided that they needed to sell their library, including the manuscripts in the Larkin plays, to pay their taxes. So at Bridgewater House, uh, the collection had been open to scholars at the beginning of the 20th century, and there are footnotes that reference the shelf marks from Bridgewater House uh, in, in scholarship. So when it came to the Huntington, it's never been changed. It was never recataloged. Um, we assigned unique, uh, unique numbers to the printed books, but we've kept the manuscript call numbers to be exactly the same as they were when the collection was owned by the, the Ellesmere family. Packaged up the entire library in these giant wooden crates and they loaded them onto a steamship. That, um, according to the story that we all can read in Dickinson's volume, um, Henry Huntington actually paid someone to stand on the docks with binoculars to watch the ship until it like passed the horizon and was no longer visible. And then they wired to New York to say, We can't see the ship anymore. And then he paid someone to stand on the docks in New York to watch the ship to wire to California as soon, or wire to Henry Huntington, um, as soon as they could see it on the horizon. Because if you, you know, think of your world history in 1917, World War I was still raging. And there was this great fear that German boats would sink the ship that had the Bridgewater Library on it. Um, I've told this story many times, and even now my stomach churns thinking about what that would mean if that had happened. And I'm extremely grateful, as I know we all are, that that didn't happen. So Henry Huntington's bloke is standing on the dock with their binoculars. They see the ship come in um, to port safely. They unload the crates. They load them onto trains. And they ship them to Southern California. Um, Henry Huntington uh, was the nephew of Collis Huntington, who was one of the big four railroad magnates. And that's where they made most of their money. Um, so. Henry, uh, you know, railroads are an essential part of the creation of the Huntington. And this is really this, this logistics of being able to move a collection like this in 1917 from the UK across the Atlantic and then across North America to get to Southern California is, is quite a feat unto itself. And I actually think we, we need a few more books about this story. He purchased the collection um, as a, a private sale that was orchestrated by George Smith, who was one of the, the great famous book collectors and um, or of book dealers in the period. And George Smith was one of Henry Huntington's kind of go-to men. A lot of the organizations early on, a lot of the early acquisitions were orchestrated by George Smith on behalf of Henry Huntington. Um, and Sotheby's also helped kind of negotiate the sale. Uh, the deal was that Henry Huntington would pay $500,000 um, to kind of secure the collection, and then he would pay another $500,000 upon the receipt of the collection. So all in all, these collections, the Bridgewater Library and Ellesmere Manuscripts and Larpent Plays, cost Henry Huntington $1 million in 1917, which is about uh, $24 million dollars today. I mean, it's, it's really flawed to try and do that kind of calculation, but it helps to just give you a sense of 
the value of this collection and the value of this collection to someone like Henry Huntington. Uh, so, you know, close to $24 million today for this acquisition. Actually, when the collection came to San Marino and they were unpacking it, they realized that a portion of the collection actually wasn't there, that the Earls of Ellesmere had cherry picked out a few, um, some of the manuscripts and decided to keep them for themselves. And then there were for many decades, uh, this back and forth about what Henry Huntington had actually agreed to pay for. One of the things that he ultimately settled on was they could keep those manuscripts that they cherry picked out, but they had to send the Bridgewater calendar, which is the full 10 volume description of every manuscript in the manuscript collection. So uh, once Henry Huntington received those 10 volumes, then he paid the rest of the, the half a million dollars that he owed for it. So in actuality, um, about 1,300 manuscripts remain in the private collection of uh, the descendants of the Earls of Ellesmere. Today, they're called the Dukes of Sutherland. Um, and in the 1960s, the Huntington Library worked with the National Library in Scotland to serve as agents, and we got microfilm of all of the manuscripts that remained in the private collection. And then we printed off the microfilm and interleaved it into the collection. So for a lot of researchers or any of you, if you've ever been and you've gone through the collection, um, you'll be looking at original material and then all of a sudden you'll come to these really grainy black and white printouts. And that's the microfilm printout because the original manuscript is still with the family, um, the, the Dukes of Sutherland in Scotland. So the crown jewel of this collection, which I'm, you know, Arguably, the fact that Henry Huntington got all of these things for that price and this manuscript is, is pretty stellar. This is the Ellesmere Chaucer. Um, it is a copy of, it's the copy of Geoffrey Chaucer's Canterbury Tales that is just absolutely gorgeous. It's handsome. It's illuminated. It's, uh, it's on the softest parchment you've ever felt. Um, and it was... Geoffrey Chaucer lived to oversee the early production of this manuscript. So this is considered to be the authoritative version of Canterbury Tales. It's the most complete. It has mo the majority of the tales. There's, there's three different versions of 15th century, early 15th century copies of the Canterbury Tales. So literary scholars often read all three of them together. And it's been determined, I mean, this debate was settled ages ago, that this copy, the Ellesmere copy, is the order of the tales that Geoffrey Chaucer wanted them to be in. Um, so it's a pretty spectacular manuscript. It's, it's probably the most important manuscript written in English, in the English language. Um, Geoffrey Chaucer spoke a Southern dialect, lived in London, and, you know, he was a clerk in London. Um, and when he was writing this tale, his, his structure for the tales is actually based on Boccaccio's Decameron, right? Pilgrims telling each other different stories to entertain the group over the course of this journey. And in this case, the pilgrims are making their pilgrimage to Canterbury Cathedral. So each pilgrim tells a story and those stories get compiled and that becomes this body of work. And he was writing this in, you know, by, by all accounts, what really is the Renaissance. But he wasn't the story isn't written in Latin, it's in the common vernacular language, which is English, of course, in, in England. Um, but because Chaucer was from the South, he had a, a Southern accent. And so that's the vernacular that was used for the verses of the Canterbury Tales. And because this is one of the, it, right from the moment it was created, became such an influential literary work, it meant that this dialect of English became kind of the standard dialect. So it has a long resonance in the, the vernacular and linguistical shape of verse in England. And it really all stems from this manuscript that you see on your screen. Um, we'll talk about it in, in more detail in, in just a bit. But uh, I would be remiss not to tell you that one of the high points of my career was uh, the Huntington celebrated its centennial in 19, uh, in 2019, 2020. And so to mark that occasion, 
the institution commissioned a parade of a float for the Rose Parade. Um, and I got a phone call one day that said, you're the curator for the Ellesmere Chaucer. What do you want the pages to be that go on to the parade float? Uh, so I got to pick, um, I, they, it's not an actual opening. I was supposed to pick two really decorated pages to put them together so that it would look really vibrant as it was, you know, the, ro the float going down Colorado Boulevard on, on January 1st. So I picked the general prologue because obviously it's the general prologue of the Canterbury Tales. Um, but then I was really subversive and I chose the wife of Bath as the tale um, to display because I just love the idea of the wife of Bath parading on New Year's Day down Colorado Boulevard. It just brought me a lot of pleasure. Nobody ever asked about it. Nobody said anything about it, but um, just kind of let you in on a little secret. Our New Year's float was the wife of Bath because I'm a feminist historian and curator and I can do what I want <laughs> in this particular instance. One of the other things that's so phenomenal about this collection is the fact that also with it, you know, when you buy a library in black, you get it all. And one of the things that Henry Huntington acquired at this time was his uh, first folio. Um, the collection came with, with copies of Shakespeare's first folio. And so, you know, talk about these high points that in one single library, you have uh, the Canterbury Tales and the first folio together. It just bridges. It allows you, and you can imagine all these other books and manuscripts along the way that make the connection between Chaucer and Shakespeare. And so this really is, you know, to say library of libraries, this library, this archive is uh, a real, a really important seed for studying the Renaissance writ large. It's, it's not really possible to think about the English Renaissance, to think about the evolution of language without the, the evolution of, of verse, without thinking about the Ellesmere manuscripts in the British, uh, in the Bridgewater, um, the Bridgewater Library. So uh, while we have the first folio from this, and now the Huntington has you know, a total of four copies of the first folio, which is nothing compared to our friends at the Shakespeare, the Folger Shakespeare Library in Washington, DC, which has the world's largest collection of Shakespeare on it. Um, one of the things that the Huntington, that Henry Huntington started doing after this acquisition was he started what we call selling the dupes, selling duplicate copies of books that he had. So he would not have multiple, he would choose the one that he thought was the finer copy of his library and thought were the finer copy uh, and then sell the others. And that makes perfect sense. I'm, I'm completely understand why he did that. Uh, but Steve Tabor and I will both cringe to tell you that one of the things that Henry Huntington sold as a duplicate was the first printing of Milton's uh, mask um, of Comus that was made for the Bridgewater family. It was performed by the children of the Bridgewater family, but I can't show you a picture of it because we don't own it anymore. Henry Huntington sold that one as a duplicate copy. The majority of the collection actually doesn't look like these stellar, you know, the first folio and the Ellesmere Chaucer. This is what the majority of the collection actually looks like. Um, thousands and thousands of what we lovingly call scruffy little manuscripts. Um, the collection, because it is the family archive for this Renaissance family, um, it contains financial, religious, political, legal, um, correspondence, it includes marriage contracts, it includes uh, loads and loads of lawsuits because early modern people just love to sue each other. Um, it includes inventories and also uh, description, like records of when people were born, pedigrees, basically, that, that list the name of children, where they were born. It... Oh, sorry, hold on one second, please. <laughs> I apologize. I'm so in the zone telling you about this collection that I love. I didn't notice that we just had an earthquake. <laughs> so my husband just came because there was an earthquake warning because we just had an earthquake. Um, nothing stops me from talking about this library. That's how <laughs> devoted I am to this collection. <laughs> so it, 
was actually the fact that this collection um, contains <laughs> all of these legal histories, all of these uh, personal family stories that are, you know, situated against Elizabethan politics and literature um, in the, the Reformation and the Renaissance. And that, it is this collection that actually brought me to the Huntington as a graduate student when I was working um, on what is now my book, um, the, A Woman of Influence, a Spectacular Rise about Spencer and Tudor England. It is about the family um, that started this library, um, both the, the men and the women and how uh, the library does feature into the book, but it's really about the lived experiences of these women in particular that would be completely lost to our knowledge if it weren't for the Ellesmere collection. Um, it really tells the story. My book and in, in the, the founders of this library, this is Alice Edgerton and uh, Thomas Edgerton. He was Baron Ellesmere. He's the reason why the collection is named Ellesmere. He was Queen Elizabeth's uh, keeper of the great seal. And then he was uh, King James is when James, King James the sixth of Scotland, the first of England, ascended to the throne. Um, he became uh, head of the Chancery Court. So he was the Lord Chancellor Ellesmere. And a lot of his court proceedings and a lot of his writings about the law make up the bulk of the, the early portion of the Ellesmere collection. Um, along with a memo that he wrote about Alice, his wife, um, saying that uh, she's the most awful woman he had ever met and that he thanks God that he never prayed for a long life because the sooner he died, the sooner he would get away from her cursed wailing tongue and her disdainful carriage. Um, so there's a whole lot of personal details in this collection as well. But one of the reasons why scholars have been drawn to this collection is um, as you may recall, there's so much work done about King James being somewhat of an absolutist. And Thomas Ellesmere, being the head of the Chancery Courts, was really reforming the courts in the beginning of the 17th century to expand uh, judicial prerogative. And this collection allows you to plot almost like blow by blow this conflict between royal prerogative and judicial prerogative that shaped, that kind of led or created the cornerstone for the Anglo-American legal system before the English Civil War, um, before Cook, basically. Um, and Ellesmere was the person that did that. And this collection shows his life, private life, um, his many, his many uh, miserable moments with his, his wife, but also his, his phenomenal legal mind. And the fact that he truly, this couple and their children, um, really were these, they, they were Renaissance people. They were book collectors and patrons um, and legal thinkers that gave shape to what culture was in, in the English speaking world for a very long time. So I'll, this is just such a quick crash course, but what I wanna say here is that Henry Huntington kind of gave us this gift in 1917 and it's served as a core collection, um, but we continue to build to strengths. And so, um, for example, we're always looking for things, not just thematically that build legal history, reformation, religion, gender, politics, um, you know, uh, financial history, but all of these lenses that we can, uh, these themes that we see in the collection. But we also look for ways where we can find these little stray bits about the family themselves. Uh, so this, for example, is it's an epicedium, which typically is a funeral elegy or a funeral ode. But in this case, it's actually an ode that was made to celebrate the marriage of Gervase Cutler and Magdalene Edgerton. Um, Magdalene's grandfather was Thomas Edgerton. His, uh, her mother was Alice's daughter. Her father was Thomas's son. So in the case of the Edgerton family, step siblings got married. Um, it was a real Renaissance Brady Bunch kind of vibe. Um, and this blended family to the next level. And so it traces the collection, tells us multiple generations. And this is something that my predecessor, Mary Robertson, who was the curator of manuscripts at the Huntington for 43 years before I started working there. Um, Mary acquired this manuscript in 2004. 
So, well, Mary brought it into the collection 20 years ago. In the last five or six years, um, because we've digitized it and because more and more people are coming to do research at the Huntington, we've actually started to use this manuscript to make connections with other collectors. And it turns out that the current Earl of Derby, he's the 19th Earl of Derby, he lives at Nosley Hall up in the north of England, he has a manuscript in his collection that's made by the exact same artist for the same family as what you're seeing on your screen here. So one day his curator showed up in my office and started asking about this manuscript. And because the collection was where it was um, and has been used for over a century and is published a lot and is portions of it are now digitized like this manuscript, um, it means that even though this stuff has been the stuff, this stuff has been here for so long, we continue to make new connections within our own collections and collections that still exist in private hands in the UK. It just broadens out this conversation um, in a way that I'm actually not sure Henry Huntington ever envisioned would be possible. Um, this is another. Uh, marriage indenture that I purchased a couple years ago at the Peary sale. This is, again, this is one of uh, Mary Edgerton is uh, a granddaughter of Thomas Edgerton um, and Alice Edgerton. And this is a single manuscript. It probably was the, it's a marriage indenture for Richard Herbert and Mary Edgerton. It's probably the Herbert uh, copy of the indenture, which is why it, it left the collection but it, it hit a, a Sotheby's auction and I brought it back, I, you know, with our support of our, our acquisition funders and, and friends, we were able to bring this back into the folds of the collection. Um, this actually circulated in our reading room last week as someone is there looking at the politics of negotiating marriage and marriage settlements in early modern England. And this was a source um, that somebody just paged up a couple of days ago, in fact. And then my favorite story, um, and Steve, I'm, I'm, please feel free to jump in during the Q&A with this, because this was really a, a success of my colleague, Steve Tabor, who's on the call. Um, a couple of years ago, a book dealer uh, approached uh, Steve Tabor, the curator of early printed books, with the volume that you see on your screen with the FB. And the thought was, this is a book that came probably from Francis Bacon's library. And the Huntington also has acquired um, what is called Francis Bacon's Library. So the dealer thought this could be a good fit for the collections there. Um, but when Steve started doing a little bit of research, he had this lightning bolt kind of moment and realized this book did not belong to Francis Bacon. It belonged to Francis Bridgewater, who is the daughter-in-law slash stepdaughter of Thomas Edgerton and the daughter of Alice Edgerton. Um, so this, this generation of family that I keep talking about, this was a book that actually originated in the Bridgewater Library. And for a series of, of events, uh, Frances Bridgewater often would give her books away as gifts to people in the, she died in 1637, 1630, she died in 1633, sorry. Um, and so while she was building her library, which you can see this picture on the screen, these are books, um, that belonged to her, her or were you know, contemporary copies of books that belonged to her um, as part of the Bridgewater Library. She often gifted them. And so the books would make their way out into the world. And in this instance, in 2016, um, through Steve's diligent sleuthing and expertise in the collection, we were able to actually bring this book back to the library and reunite it with the books that it had been separated from um, 400 years ago. It's a pretty exciting story. So beyond the research uh, that's done in this collection with by the readers in the reading room every day, by me, by Steve Tabor, um, what are the, the places that you most often interact with the collection is in exhibition. It's a deep, rich collection that is just always ready for exhibition. We try to keep the Ellesmere Chaucer on exhibit um, as much as possible. A lot of visitors, local visitors come pretty regularly 
And I've watched people walk through our gallery and they just kind of like look at it and walk away. Um, and I stopped someone once and said, was, you know, just asked them why they took a quick glance and walked away. And they said, oh, we come every week and we just wanted to check to make sure it was still here. And it just brought me so much joy. And I was able to say, we're, it's still here. It's not going anywhere. Um, the Ellesmere manuscript. So this is a picture of it in its case on exhibit in our library main hall exhibition. Um, but this manuscript, as you can imagine, is treated better than most human beings are treated. Um, so it stays on exhibit for uh, 18 months. We turn the pages to different portions of the opening every three months so that it takes pressure off the spine so as to not force it to end up having an opening of what we call a preferred opening where the pages don't close flat. You know, if you keep a book open for years and years at a time and never turn the page, when you close it, it will never lie flat the way it was because it's it's been open for so long. So we do page turns every three months to make sure that doesn't happen. And then after 18 months, we take the entire volume off exhibit and we put it in this box that you have that you can see here. It was a custom box that was built um, in the 1990s by a book finder, um, Anthony Keynes, who was from Trinity and came to the Huntington to restore the binding and, and rebind the Ellesmere Chaucer. Uh, and you lift that lid up that you can see and you slide it into the box and then you see that kind of like boomerang looking thing. You press down on it and slide it into place and it puts just exactly the right amount of pressure on the book so that if, you know, God forbid the humidity went crazy in the building because the, the volume is parchment. The pages could expand and contract and breathe, but they would never, it would never just wildly expand. So it puts it, it keeps it really safe and snug um, as, as it rests. That's what we call it. The Ellesmere is resting for six months. Um, we take it off, uh, we take it, we wake it up, we take it out of the box, we put it back on exhibit and the system starts over again. Um, visitors are always very disappointed when we take the Ellesmere Chaucer off exhibition, but it is also such a wonderful opportunity to talk to people about caring for books and not just, um, you know, and thinking about our responsibility to make this material outlive all of us. Um, so one of the ways that we also do that is of course with digitization. Um, I won't spend too long making you look at an Excel spreadsheet, but I just show you this so you get a sense of these are, uh, the medieval manuscript volumes, the codexes in the collection. It's not all of them, but it's a, it's a chunk of them. This is, these are statistics for how often they're viewed on our digital library. Um, and you can see that the Canterbury Tales reigns supreme with over 140,000 clicks every single year of people who are using the Canterbury Tales online. Um, it's certainly, it's either under glass or it's resting safely in our vault. So the best way for people to use it for high school teachers to teach the prologue and study the literature of it is, is with the digital copy that we have. But I have to tell you, uh, while the Ellesmere Chaucer never circulates in the reading room, the majority of the collection circulates all the time. And that's where I think it's the most exciting to see people pouring over these books reading them, studying them, generating knowledge, generating creative endeavors through these collections. So I'm happy to answer questions. Um, I know I covered a lot of ground and I did it very quickly, um, but I, I'm just so grateful for an opportunity to talk to you about this collection that I love so much. Vanessa, I'm considering a visit. When is the Ellesmere Chaucer coming off exhibit next? The Ellesmere Chaucer is currently off exhibit and it's about to go back on in March. Um, we are planning for a bit of a renovation project. So we're trying to stagger it a little bit. So it's rotation cycle might get a little bit wonky in the next year, um, but it should be on exhibit next year. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Uh, Vanessa, I, uh, there's a book which you're probably f familiar with, uh, The Bookseller of Florence uh, by Ross King. Mm -hmm. um, we were able to, uh, a couple of years ago, um, um, 
have Ross talk about that book. And I, I read it and I wrote a, a review of it for our journal. And I thought it was just a, it was a wonderful uh, 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 discussion about how manuscripts were, were being uh, generated um, and discovered really um, in um, in the uh, early Renaissance um, in in Florence, and um, I just wonder if perhaps you know whether you have any um, manuscripts in your collection that would have been generated by Vespasiano's um, um, uh, uh, what I want to say his scriptorum. Um, I I don't know off the top of my head, but it wouldn't surprise me if mm -hmm. we did. Yeah. Because well, a lot of his collections went to the Pope and, and went to other people in in um you know in uh Italy. Um but I'm not sure to what extent um so maybe that's the other way to ask the question is uh, where did uh a lot of these manuscripts where were they uh written? Um, how were they acquired by the uh, by the Bridgerton, uh, Bridgewater and Ellesmer uh, families uh, back back then? Do you do you have much background on that? Yeah. So most of these manuscripts were produced in England, or they were produced. You know, the illuminated manuscripts. Um, there's a lot of prayer books and things like that. A lot of those are produced in Western Europe but they're primarily made for an English market in the 15th century. Mm -hmm. So like books of hours, um, most of those were made not in England. There are some that were made in England that we have in the collection. Um, but really the, the scriptorium kind of epicenters for those really lavish manuscripts are in Flanders or in Rome or in Florence or in, you know, in Paris. Um, so a lot of the collections, a lot of the medieval manuscripts came from Western Europe, but they were produced for an English market. Most of all of the manuscripts, the manuscripts in the Ellesmere collection were really generated by Edgerton's contemporaries in England. They're, you know, a lot of them really are those scruffy ephemeral notes that you wouldn't think would be saved, but they get folded into this family archive. And then as centuries pass, they become more and more valuable and important. Um, but the Bridgewater books, and I'm not, you know, because we've separated the collection as printed material and mm -hmm. manuscript material. Um, a lot of, most of the books did come from, were printed in England or printed um, for an English market, but there are loads of others. I think that we've got, it's surprising how much shows up from Italy, how much shows up from um, the German states in the, the collections as well. Mm -hmm. You know, for a long time, certainly in Henry Huntington's life, people really, um, there was just rampant Anglophilia in in America. And so Henry Huntington really was talked about building collection of through a British lens. Um, but of course, today, when scholars are looking at them, we tend to think so much more transnationally uh, than than Huntington did. Um, so we're starting to bring new lenses to those collections, and we're seeing a lot more European material in this library than than previously had been thought of. Mm -hmm. I saw a question here of whether there were uh, whether there's the, the library is still acquiring collections or are you looking more at individual items uh, or uh, portions of collections, perhaps? Um, both. We are still acquiring collections. Um, you know, the, the big heyday of those sales that uh, allowed people like Morgan and Folger and Huntington to build the core of their collection, those sales don't happen as much as they, you know, the way they used to at the beginning of the 20th century. So for me, I acquire a lot less uh, than a lot of my colleagues do, but those, you know, printed books certainly were acquiring regularly um, from incunabula up through modern, modern text. Mm -hmm. um, so I buy less, but what I buy tends to be older. <laughs> I see a question here. Do you have any books Maps uh, written, great. Oops, I lost it. Yeah, by Hocklet. Yeah. yeah, you see that? Yeah, okay, here we, we go. <laughs> loads and loads. Yep. Is 
So the answer is yes. 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 <laughs> <laughs> Uh, let's see, what do I? And I, I see someone asking about, um, because of the Mexican Alta California focus, has there been much acquiring material from Spain? Uh, the answer is really generally no. We do have, we do acquire some material from Spain if it fits thematically into the, the purview of the collection. But generally speaking, we do not acquire a lot from Spain, but we do grow the collections um, from material it, around material generated in the Spanish Empire in the Americas, and certainly the legacy of the Spanish in the Americas is it's still an active collecting field for us. I I see a financial question popping up here. Uh, maybe this is your personal buying budget, or the budget, <laughs> <laughs> or the budget for your uh, for the library itself for acquisitions, and yeah, and maybe. It. Also gets into perhaps governance of the of the library and how that's structured these days. Um, the budget question is a tricky one because uh, as a nonprofit we have so many restricted funds. So we have hundreds of acquisition funds of varying amounts. A lot of them were very generously established by donors um, who are passionate about a collecting area in their own right, and they wanted to support that collecting at the Huntington. So. Um, we have dedicated funds that allow us to grow more aggressively in some areas than in others. Um, and most of those are all endowed funds. Uh, most of they, those are always, I'm sorry, they're most they're always endowed funds. funds. Endowed. Yes, right. Yeah, um, we do have you know, some kind of unrestricted funds, but those funds fluctuate a lot from any given year, just depending on the, the nature of the market. Um, and then we also have an extremely generous circle of supporters who as something, you know, comes up that we could never anticipate, but an opportunity to acquire something might come up. Um, and we are often able to approach one of our supporters and they acquire it as a gift for the library or they, um, they give us the funds to acquire it. Mm -hmm. In the other collecting areas, not so much in mine, but you know, certainly in the Pacific Rim collections, for example, or in California history, which is uh, you know a lot more contemporary, um, a lot of our acquisitions are coming from people who are donating their own family letters or diaries or map collections mm -hmm. and things of that nature. Um, so, so the material continues to come to us, uh, but in a lot of different ways. Right. right. So um, I see. A, I have a question about the. Um, I mean, the library itself, I, that is, is told, well told in, in the book, uh, completed right around the start of the Depression. And it was remarkable that uh, even though he became constrained as to funding, he did complete the library as planned. And uh, it was a real testament to his dedication to, to this, to the legacy that he created. Um, but this is 1930-ish uh, when yeah. it got done. So you're talking 1917. Um, um, I have forgotten uh, when did the, when did he start collecting and what kind of facility did he have? Um, it probably had a large house, I assume. Yeah. Uh, but uh, yeah, so he, how, how he was had, it going before? How did it kind of start before 1917? He he lived in New York for early on, and his collecting was in New York. He lived up um, in I think Oneonta or up, uh, upstate New York, but then he also had you know one of those you know, Upper East Side mansions um, that he lived in. If you watch the, the HBO show, The Gilded Age, um, one of the characters in that show is actually based on Arabella Huntington. Uh, so he lived very much, you know, as an East Coast, New York-based collector. But when he came to California, uh, he built the, the European art gallery where Blue Boy is. That was his mansion. Uh, that was his house, the, the oh. ranch. As, as they called it, um, Arabella hated California. She would maybe deign to go to San Francisco. She hated spending time in Southern California. She really preferred to be in New York or be in Paris. Um, so they're really, you know, they're so tied to this place now because the institution is named for them, but really their collecting happened 
in a lot of different places. The building happened, you know, the, the construction of their libraries and the construction of their the building of their art collections happened mostly on the East Coast. And then when he moved here, then it really exploded uh, with his book collecting. Mm -hmm. I, I see a question uh, about uh, about the environment, uh, about, you know, I, I assume both the both the library and the uh, uh, and the art museum are, you know, are well protected against the elements, but mm -hmm. uh, it uh, it can't be assumed. And uh, um, are you taking special measures in the last a few years to deal with with the, with the climate change? Of course, you're yeah. going to have to deal with a lot of water right now. So uh, that, <laughs> uh, I know that does happen. Know, from time to time. During the rain, I mean, the, the last year with all of the, the rains that we had in flooding that we had in California and Southern California, um, you know, we are constantly walking the perimeter of, of the library staff, looking for any leak, any drip, anywhere. So there's not a, a part of the building that doesn't get inspected regularly, uh, like routinely. But yes, we do have uh, an environmental plan. Um, we, the, the stacked spaces, the reading rooms, the library, the art museums, they are all climate controlled and regulated by our preservation team. We have really fantastic kind of top of the line systems that report hourly any fluctuation in the temperature and humidity. Um, Holly Moore, who's the head of our preservation department, manages all of that and keeps an extremely watchful eye on it. Um, but of course, you know, we can do the, the question about a plan for evacuating material. Um, we worst case scenario would be to evacuate anything. The material is so much that it's, when you move something, that's where it's really dangerous. Um, so we want to keep things where they are. We, you know, uh, certainly if there's a flood, we do have plans for, you know, getting in, moving things that we've, we've had instances in the past of little leaks and things like that. But, um, the, the larger climate crisis is something that I don't know that you can actually have a, a documented plan for you do you know best practices by regulating um, temperature and access and control. Uh, but of course, our institutional strategic plan that we are operating under has a large portion of it devoted to issues of sustainability and thinking about these drastic um, behavioral changes that we all have to make to stabilize the climate, to keep the collections safe and keep ourselves safe. Mm -hmm. right. If if somebody wanted to um, to visit the library, I know that the art museum is open uh, to uh, to the general public, uh, but the uh, I assume the reading room um, you need a pass or or is there or is there a portion that's open to the uh, to the public. Yes, I'm very happy to say that after a century, we have recently changed our, our, our access policy in the library. So now to come to the reading room, you need to make an appointment, you need to register in advance, but you don't need letters of recommendation or anything like that, like you used to. Um, it used to be you had to be an advanced graduate student. That is no longer necessary. So we are open to anybody 18 years of age and older with a research need. Um, and, you know, obviously the, the fragility and the rarity of some of the collections, we have conversations and sometimes people ask for something and it's just not safe to circulate. And we curators will talk with the researcher to come up with as many alternatives mm -hmm. as we possibly can. But as a general, generally speaking, um, if you make an appointment and you are 18 years or older and you have a research need, we want you to come use the collection. And we've been digitizing a lot more too, um, certainly during the pandemic, to make things as widely available that way as possible. But you know, nothing takes the place of of nothing. Absolutely. All of us who work there, we work there because you know, not just you know, devoted to our subjects, but also you know, our academic disciplines. But we all become curators because we like the stuff. We want to touch the books and think about the materiality and think about the climate and the housing, um, and we want. We want our readers to think about these as objects and artifacts as well. I see some positive comments coming back from that. Um, <laughs> is there? <laughs> I agree. Yeah, right, right. So um, I wonder uh, if there's um, 
Uh, let me just take the opportunity here then to to thank you, Vanessa, for this tour of the uh, of the Huntington its collection and giving us a, a a glimpse of the history and particularly of this of the remarkable uh, collection that you have. And I can see what a uh, trove it is for people researching um, that uh, important period. Um, the um, you know the Renaissance in England uh, was important there. Uh, Kind of a precursor to the uh, to the age of enlightenment as it kind of then uh, followed. So um, uh, 